Ancient atomism was a school of ancient Greek philosophy founded by Leucippus and his student Democritus. It's been argued that these atomists were the first scientists and without any doubt their worldview is more closely related to the modern scientific worldview than any of the other philosophers or thinkers in the ancient world. Their theories on atomism have more than a chance resemblance to our modern thinking. In many ways they helped to shape and inspire modernity by the emergence of Lucretius's poem containing the atomism that was an inspiration to Galileo, Newton and Dalton in the 17th and 18th centuries. In this episode we're going to look at Leucippus and Democritus and the origins, theory and importance of their school of ancient atomism. <laughs> From a historical point of view, it's hard to tell where Leucippus ends and Democritus begins. There are even doubts about whether Leucippus even existed. Epicurus, the philosophical heir to Democritus, claimed that there was no historical Leucippus, while Aristotle and his successor Theophrastus say that there was. Because of this, there was a debate for some time as to the existence of Leucippus, but the modern consensus is that there was, in fact, a historical figure. Needless to say, though, we don't know very much about him. According to Aristotle, he was the originator of atomism. He's most likely to have been born in Miletus, where the early pre-Socratics Thales, Anaximander and Anaximenes were from. But he may also have been born in Elea, the polis in southern Italy where Parmenides had his school, or Abdera, a polis in Thrace, on the northern Aegean coast where Democritus was from and where Leucippus is said to have founded his school. The one work we have that is attributed to him, the Megas Diacosmos, the big world system, complicates things more since it has also been attributed to Democritus, who also wrote another book called the Microstia Cosmos, the Little World System. So it's pretty much impossible to discern the views of Leucippus from those of Democritus, so in this video we're going to be exploring their views on atomism as if they were one. Democritus was born in the palace of Abdera and being born around a year before Socrates, it's a bit of a stretch to call him a pre-Socratic. He was one of the best travelled people of his time and travelled throughout the known world, talking with everyone from the Gymnosophists, the, the naked wise men of India, to the Chaldean Magi of Persia, and he even spent five years in Egypt studying maths with Egyptian mathematicians. He wrote on a large swathe of topics, everything from painting, medicine and history, to maths, physics physics and ethics. There's a few interesting stories about the man and the most interesting for me is that according to the historian Diogenes Laertius, Plato hated Democritus and even tried to burn all of his books that he could get his hands on but he was talked out of it by his Pythagorean friends. The reason for this alleged hatred of Plato for Democritus will become clearer as we explore the philosophy of Democritus and you'll see how it contrasts with the Platonic philosophy which operates in a realm of mystical sort of rationalism. In his book on pre-Socratic philosophy Nietzsche had this to say about Democritus. The writings of Democritus whom the ancients put on a par with Plato whom he even excels as far as ingenuity goes. The philosophy of atomism is, like the works of the other pluralists we've explored, Anaxagoras and Empedocles, best understood against the backdrop of Parmenides. Parmenides' argument proved that what is, is one, eternal and unchanging. This purely logical argument flies in the face of our day-to-day experience. Reality as Heraclitus observed, seems to be governed by change rather than devoid of it. And so for the philosophers who came after Parmenides, they had to reconcile this paradoxical thing of the the nature of reality with the, the, the appearance of reality. And so they all came up with different variations on the same theme. Anaxagoras, Empedocles and the Atomists all made the argument that yes, what is is eternal, unchanging and one, but that there are many of these ones, there are many of the eternal, unchanging components of reality. So for Anaxagoras we have the seeds and for Empedocles we have the four elements, earth, air, fire and water, which he calls roots and then with our atomists we have the atoms. All of these philosophers argue for the same thing, a multiplicity of unchanging elements that make up the world of our experience. What seems to be changing on the surface is in fact eternally unchanging when seen at its fundamental level. The pluralists all agreed that the illusion of change come from the dance of these tiny little particles. On the face of it, the atomist's response to Parmenides' challenge seems very similar to those of Empedocles and Anaxagoras, but there are a couple of distinctions that are very important. One of them is so important in my eyes that it marks the difference between the primitive state of man and the modern state of man, and marks a turning point in the evolution of human consciousness itself. First place where the atomists diverge from the other pluralists is their belief in atoms and void. The other pluralists try to satisfy the Eleatic school of Parmenides by setting aside that which is not. They try to say that there is a plenum but that the plenum is made up of these seeds and these roots. 
If that sounds paradoxical, it might be helpful to think of it as a great soup. For Anaxagoras, all these fundamental seeds interpenetrated each other in one big soup of being. The ingredients that go into the soup are distinct, but but in there they are nice and mixed up in one big thing. But the atomists go their own way and they part with the Eleatics by saying that a void can indeed and does indeed exist because motion would be impossible without it. And so in the world system of the atomists, the void is the container within which the atoms move. So this is the first major shift made by the atomists. They propose that there is an empty space within which the atoms move rather than a big soup like the plenum of the other philosophers. Interestingly, this exact debate of the plenum versus empty space was had out once again by the two great minds of the 17th century, Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz, where Newton argued for absolute space and Leibniz for the plenum. Newton won out in the short term, but Einstein ultimately gave the victory to Leibniz and the plenum gang with the space-time continuum in his theory of relativity. The second difference between the atomists and the other pre-Socratics and the philosophers that came after them is massive. It's a distinction between primary and secondary qualities. So for Anaxagoras, you have the seeds being things like moist, warm, bright, cold, and so on. And in Pedicles, you have the four elements which are named for four gods, and you have two governing forces of love and strife. So with him, you get a mix of mechanical and moral elements and forces making up the nature of the universe. All of this is innovative, but it's got as much in common with religious and mythological thinking as it does with rational scientific thinking. But with the Adamus, it's different. With them, we get a separation that is so critical to the evolution of consciousness. Here's what Democritus says. By convention, sweet. By convention, bitter. By convention, hot. By convention, cold. By convention, colour. But in reality, atoms and void. This is the first time in history where the projection of humanity on the world has been removed. It's the first time where a man has looked at the world and instead of hearing gods in the thunder and nymphs in the water, the world has become a thing in itself, stripped of its human attire. The qualities of the atoms are not warmth or coldness, sweetness or bitterness. These are secondary qualities that come about from the interaction between humans and the world that is out there. The separation between man and the world is the essence of the modern mindset and it went completely unrecognised among the ancients. The atomists looked at the world mechanistically, something outside of the moral realm of the mind. They were materialists who denuded the world of human projections. They looked at the world in terms of efficient causation rather than teleological causation. What does that mean? So efficient causation is an explanation in terms of mechanics. So when a pool ball hits another pool ball, efficient causation explains this event in terms of force and motion, while teleological causation explains it in terms of the purpose and intention of the pool player, what they were trying to achieve. Efficient causation looks for the physical explanation. Teleological causation looks for the intention behind the action, the purpose towards which it is driven. The atomists were pure believers in efficient causation and looked at the world through the eyes of a materialist. But then there was Aristotle and with him the intellectual course of Western and later Middle Eastern thinking was steered towards teleological thinking and looking for purpose and intention rather than material cause and effect. Bertrand Russell talks about this crossroads in ancient philosophy between materialist and teleological thinking in his book on the history of Western philosophy. In that book he says that it would have been hard to decide which path, the mechanical or teleological, was likely to be more fruitful for science. I do not see how it could have been known in advance which of these two questions science ought to ask, or whether it ought to ask both. But experience has shown the mechanistic question leads to scientific knowledge while the teleological question does not. The atomists asked the mechanistic question and gave a mechanistic answer. Their successors until the Renaissance were more interested in the teleological question and thus led science up a blind alley. What's so amazing to me in the atomists is how much they foreshadowed the modern scientific worldview. If the atomists had come to prominence rather than the Socratic schools of Plato and Aristotle, perhaps the world would be a very different place. As Carl Sagan remarked in his book Cosmos, perhaps if Democritus' work had not been almost completely destroyed, there would have been calculus by the time of Christ. And you can see in the atomists how accidental and serendipitous the evolution of consciousness is. The mechanistic explanation of the atoms is merely an improvement on Anaxagoras' theory where the mysterious cosmic mind principle news sets everything in motion. The atomists merely set aside his strange deus ex machina and explain the movement in mechanical terms as the collision of atoms in the void. To summarise then, the big difference between the atomists and the other pluralists is that they argue that there was a void of empty space in which the indivisible atoms collided. 
These atoms did not contain projected qualities like sweetness and warmth, which came from interaction with humans. By themselves, they had the qualities of shape, size, and weight. Everything else was a human addition. And because of these two insights of the atoms and void, and the nature of these atoms, Democritus and Leucippus set out explaining the world in purely materialist terms, without grasping psychological or moral concepts. In this, they were the cutting edge in the evolution of consciousness, a cutting edge that did not become commonplace until 2,000 years had passed and Descartes made the distinction between mind and body. So that's everything that I wanted to cover on the atomists of antiquity, Leucippus and Democritus. If you enjoyed the episode and you're new to the channel, you might like to subscribe and if you have any thoughts, insights or feedback, love to hear from you down below. Otherwise, I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.